Good afternoon. Ah, lovely. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for attending today. I'm Tom Butler. I'm the chair of the BSH's Laboratory Specialist Interest Group, or LabSIG, as it's called. And uh, we are very grateful to the BSH for asking us to uh, coordinate this meeting along with the Royal College of Pathologists today to talk about a very important issue for all of us. We're very grateful to Catherine Cargo for uh, foolishly agreeing to tell us what the answers are. Um, I'd like to introduce Lance Sandel, who's the Registrar of the Royal College of Pathologists that we're working with, um, who's going to give us a, a, a brief uh, talk and introduction to our speaker today, and then we'll have a, a great talk and we'll hopefully have some time for questions at the end. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, as Tom said, my name is Lance Sandel. I'm Registrar at the Royal College of Pathologists uh, to tell you a little bit about um, Sir John Dacey. This lecture was first established in memory of Sir John Dacey, the fourth president of the college between 1972 and 1975. The Dacey lecture is allocated to a conference organized by the BSH. The first lecture was given in 2007 by, by Dr. Trevor Baglin. Uh, Sir John Dacey, 20th July 1912 to 12th of February 2005, was born in Putney and educated at King's College Hospital Medical School and qualified in 1936. After war service with the Royal Army Medical Corps, he was senior lecturer and by 1956 professor at the Royal Postgraduate Medical School. He founded the Leukemia Research Fund in 1960. His main achievements concerned the hemolytic anemias he discovered and named Christmas disease. He was founder and editor of the British Journal of Hematology and was president of the Royal Society of Medicine in 1977. He was the original author of Practical Hematology, familiar to the dwindling number of us who sat the primary MRC path in all four major disciplines as Dacey and Lewis, now in its 12th edition. This year's lecture will be delivered by Dr. Catherine Cargo, consultant hematologist and clinical lead in the Hematological Malignancy Diagnostic Service, HMDS in Leeds. She graduated from Queen's University Belfast and completed postgraduate training in the Belfast City Hospital, completing an MSc in hemato hematopathology through the University of York. Her clinical interest is in the diagnosis and management of chronic myeloid malignancies, in particular MDS, and she sits on both the MDS and MPN NCRI study groups. She has strong genomic background, having completed a PhD exploring the use of molecular diagnostic technologies in low MDS and CMML, and has a specific research interest in CCUS and inflammatory MDS. She's also the joint clinical lead for hemato-oncology within the Northeast and Yorkshire Genomics Laboratory Hub. So uh, over to Catherine Cargo. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, um, thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you for the invite to come and talk about this controversial area. Um, I will do my best to try and make some sense of it for you. Um, I guess I was probably the obvious choice for this talk because I'm, I both work in diagnostics and I also I'm quite, um, well, I've grown up in Northern Ireland, so I understand conflict and resolution. Um, <laughs> so what we're going to talk to about today is which diagnosis shall we give and how to manage these two new international hematological malignancy diagnostic classifications. So just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how did we get here? What are the main differences between the classifications? What options do we have for managing the classification systems? And then what are the plans nationally going forward? So if we think about tumor classification and what we should ultimately be doing to optimize classification across all cancers, um, this really should be based on accurate and robust literature. Um, we should be enabling rapid updates, mainly because this field moves so rapidly and so quickly. The information should be easily accessible and probably should be available online. It should be standardized, and there should be a multidisciplinary team input when putting the classification together. And ultimately, this should allow for um, research study, studies to be comparable globally. It should ensure diagnoses are applicable internationally and will allow trial results to be applied widely. I think having all of this together should um, hopefully create a standardized classification for the disease in question. So historically, for both lymphoid and myeloid malignancies, um, prior to the WHOs, this was very much focused on single institutions or regional classifications, particularly for lymphoid diseases. With respect to myeloid, it was very much by disease subtype, um, mostly by the FAB classification group. 
and moving on from that, the, it really moved quicker for the lymphoid side of things, where the NCI tried to create, I suppose, combine the six most common lymphoid classifications, and they developed a working formulation, which actually became a classification in itself. But it was the real classification which was developed by the International Lymphoma Study Group, um, which combined um, clinical, pathological, and genomic data and incorporated all of that into the classification going forward. And it was at this point that the WHO, um, who hadn't really incorporated hematological malignancies consistently into their classifications, approached um, the pathological groups that were involved in the real classification about um, forming the WHO classification. And at that stage, we were very, I suppose it was a great um, plan that they put together the lymphoid and the myeloid groups and classified them all under one classification. And since then, we've had three WHO classifications, and um, the most recent being published in book form in 2017. So historically, the WHO classification process was overseen by the two major hematopathology societies, and that was in America, the Society for Hematopathology, and then the European Association for Hematopathology. And it was very much centered on input from a clinical advisory committee, which included leading international pathologists, oncologists, hematologists, and geneticists. But there was a review of the WHO process, and this wasn't just for hematology, this was across all cancers, and there was some concerns about the time between editions. Um, the Blue Book series is all um, updated at the same time, and we all remember that there was quite a long time between um, edition two and edition three, and really when they surveyed the users, it was felt that this should be shortened to about five years, so this was going to be quite a task. And <clears throat> in order to achieve this, um, and the new series editor, Ian Cray, wanted to make some changes, they also raised issues about small, a small number of series editors, and it was them that were tasked to appoint the authors, and there was a likelihood of bias. And also with particular respect to haematology, this clinical advisory committee was self-appointed, was being run by many of the same individuals, and the process for um, appointing new members was obscure. So they decided to change the whole process across the Blue Book series. Um, it was very much focused on identifying experts, both um, from the um, editors, so the main editors of the WHO, and they were appointed by the hematopathology or the pathology um, national groups or international groups. Um, and then the um, editors and authors were then identified both from their literature um, or the literature in the last five years, and also from the expert editors that were identified. And then there was a very um, well-defined process that should occur for writing um, each of the WHO classifications. And what they were keen to do was to keep it consistent across all cancer types, so that the classification would fall under all of these um, defined categories. So with respect to haematology, um, the process was planned to be multidisciplinary. It was to include hematopathologists, geneticists, and clinical haematologists and oncologists. There was going to be public input. But the clinical advisory committee that had been the center of the classifications in the past was going to be removed, as this wasn't standard across the other cancer groups. But there would be, in replace, in, to replace that, a dedicated meeting with, the clinical, um, with clinical input to discuss the clinical implications of any changes. So that created a little bit of, um, I suppose, unhappiness. Um, and this was um, the original paper that was published by this um, new group, the International Consensus Classification Group. Um, and that was back in February of last year. Um, and what they did state in that is that they had had several meetings between the leaders of the hematopathology groups and the series editor of the WHO. They had made their statement clear that they wanted to continue with the clinical advisory committee, but there was no consensus reached. So the decision was that they would produce their own classification. So they identified clinical and pathology co-chairs, which were authors on this paper. Um, and these co-chairs then identified participants for their clinical advisory committee, and they met in September 2021 to proceed using the historical process that was done for previous WHOs. So now we've ended up in the position now where we've got the ICC classification of myeloid and lymphoid malignancies, and that was published in blood, and then around the same time we got the WHO fifth edition. 
published in Leukemia. We are expecting um, books for both of these. The blue book, the WHO, is just finishing its consultation process online, and the blue book is expected later this year, towards the end of the year, I think. Um, there is also a plan for the ICC to be published in book form, but we, I'm not aware of a date for that. So how different are these classifications? So overall, the majority of the differences are nomenclature. There is striking concordance in some of the sections. So if you read some of those, you could be fooled in thinking that they've been written by the same person. Um, but there are other areas where there's differences which could significantly impact on patient management. So what I thought I would do, rather than just listing the different classifications and spotting the differences, was to just take a few cases um, and highlight what the differences are and what impact that could have on patients. So I want to start with um, a low-grade B-cell lymphoma, and we're going to work through a few different disease types. So um, this case is a 55-year-old male presenting with a leukocytosis, anemia and thrombocytopenia, and also splenomegaly. Um, he had a lymphocytosis with some hairy projections and prominent central nucleoli. Flow cytometry showed pan B-cell antigen expression with 11C and 103 expression, but no 25 and no 200, so not a classical hairy cell phenotype. And there was no evidence of a BRAF mutation on this patient. So historically, this patient in the previous WHO would be diagnosed as hairy cell leukemia variant. In the new WHO, they would now be defined as splenic B-cell lymphoma leukemia with prominent nucleoli. The ICC, he would be called hairy cell leukemia variant. So I think this is the theme that we will go along is the scenarios where we're getting two different diagnoses depending on the clinical features of the patient. So <clears throat> what you can see here is what has happened with these, I suppose, splenic B-cell lymphomas um, between the WHO fourth edition and the new WHO and the ICC. You can see the ICC have, consist have been consistent with the previous WHO fourth edition, but the WHO have created this new category. So as we've said, splenic B-cell lymphoma with prominent nucleoli, and that encompasses hairy cell leukemia variant and also BPLL, which has now been removed. Both of those have been removed as defined categories. Um, and you can see from this, the splenic B-cell lymphoma is the one with prominent nucleoli is the one in purple. And you can see what is creating that. It's patients with a small group of patients with splenic marginal zone lymphoma, hairy cell leukemia variant, as we've discussed, and the BPLL patients. And it's predominantly the CD5 negative BPLL patients, which will now fall in this category. BPLL has otherwise been distributed across mantle cell lymphoma. We know that a proportion of these patients will be defined as mantle cell lymphoma genetically. And there's also this category of pro-lymphocytic progression of CLL, um, which is a high-risk CLL group based on the proportion of B pro-lymphocytic B pro-lymphocytes, um, and that will encompass most of the CD5 positive BPLLs historically. Now, for us in HMDS and Leeds, this is not got a really big impact because this is not a diagnosis that we have been using recently for many of the reasons that have been discussed that they have been shown to be other diagnoses if you look genetically and um, using other um, criteria. So this splenic B-cell lymphoma leukemia with prominent nucleoli, this is the criteria that the WHO use. Um, really it's just circulating lymphoid cells with prominent nucleoli and a B-cell phenotype without hairy cell um, characteristics and usually involvement of the spleen. Importantly, the BPLL is retained in the ICC, but they have made this statement that it only should be recognized after you exclude other lymphoid neoplasms, including what is highlighted in the WHO, transformation of CLL, mantle cell lymphoma, and splenic marginal zone lymphoma. But this has already created some angst amongst hematopathologists in particular, and this has been raised particularly by the French group who have published a comment to the authors of the WHO and they've raised some concerns about what was the rationale for combining these two groups and that they feel that BPLL harbors distinct genetic alterations and I suppose this potentially could lead to patients being managed slightly differently if they're being called different things and this is also confusing from a patient perspective, giving potentially different diagnoses. And what the WHO feedback was is that BPLL lacks sufficient distinction for a separate disease entity. 
And really splitting these rare poor risk patient groups into distinct entities adds barriers to trial design. Um, and I think the trial aspect really does um, raise some issues going forward and we'll come back to that later. But what they have said is this is best regarded as a placeholder entity which needs further studies. So if we just move on to high grade B cell lymphoma and the area that's caused some contention there. If the case is a 63-year-old female presenting with widespread lymphadenopathy and cytopenias and has a raised LDH, lymph node biopsy was consistent with DLBCL, and then FISH analysis has confirmed the presence of a MYC rearrangement and a BCL6 rearrangement. So previously, in the last WHO, this would fall into the category of double-hit lymphomas or triple-hit lymphomas, and this was called high-grade B-cell lymphoma with MYC and BCL2 and or. BCL6 rearrangements, and they were all grouped together at that stage as high-risk disease. Now, in the new WHO, these patients are put back into DLBCL, but the ICC have retained them as a distinct entity of high-grade B-cell lymphoma with MYC and BCL6 rearrangements. So again, a scenario where there's discrepant diagnoses. And you can see um, where these patients have been redistributed. So the purple on the left is the high grade, the original WHO um, from the fourth edition. And you can see that the BCL6 and MIC rearranged cases have gone into DLBCL. And then the BCL2 rearranged and MIC rearranged cases have gone into their own defined category. Um, and this is really based on some literature which was published back in 2020 in leukemia which showed that if you actually looked at these BCL6 double hit and single hit cases, that the, there was, this is looking at mutation, underlying mutation profile and molecular subtype, is that there was no real pattern, mutational signature I detected in the BCL6 mutated cases, um, rearranged cases, sorry. Um, but that was in contrast to the BCL2 double hit and triple hit rearranged cases, which did show some um, evidence of a mutational signature, and there was a very strong correlation with mutations which we very commonly see um, at the top there, BCL2, KMT2D, CREB-BP, um, and EZH2, which we most commonly see in um, follicular lymphoma. And also, when they looked at the BCL2 MIC rearranged cases, um, there was a very strong correlation with molecular subtype. Um, you can see in the left pie chart that these patients were by far most commonly um, molecular high grade or germinal center B cell type. Um, in contrast, the um, BCL6 MIC double hits um, showed molecular subtypes across the spectrum. So there, from a WHO perspective, again, they felt that there was insufficient data to define them as a distinct category. What they feel is that if you put these patients in the DLBCL subgroup, um, there's probably better ways of defining poor risk if they're all grouped together and it's not necessarily based on the MIC and BCL6 rearrangements. In contrast, um, the ICC have, similar to the WHO, they've got this MIC BCL2 rearranged category, but they have retained the entity of um, double hit um, MIC BCL6. They have said that the data to support it being a distinct entity is less compelling, but because there are poor outcomes reported, they have retained it as a provisional entity. And I think this does highlight a potential group, if being called high risk, that could be potentially treated differently based on the fact that they're um, moved into that high risk group rather, or the high grade lymphoma group rather than DLBCL. And then this, other area, which I know has um, created a lot of discussion, um, both nationally and in our labs and um, internationally, is the area of the boundary between AML and MDS. And I'm going to discuss a couple of different scenarios for this. Um, so this is a 65-year-old male who presents with pancytopenia. Peripheral blood shows dysplastic neutrophils and 5% circulating blasts. The bone marrow shows trilineage dysplasia, 16% blasts on a manual diff. Cytogenetics is normal, and NGS has mutations in genes that we commonly see in MDS, ASXL1 and STAG2, and also in TET2. So historically, with 16% BLAST, this would be MDS with excess BLAST2. Now, by WHO, they've changed the um, name slightly to MDS with increased BLAST2, 
But the ICC have gone with this new term, MDS slash AML. This very much aligns with the new AML categories, and they would be defined as MDS slash AML with M myelodysplasia related gene mutations. So as you can see, that's quite a, a difference with regard to nomenclature, but what does that mean um, for the patient? So what the ICC have stated about this new diagnostic term, they've said the blast threshold for a definitive diagnosis of AML remains at 20%. Um, but what they wanted to do was acknowledge the biologic continuum between MDS and AML. So they have changed the historical group of MDS with excess blast 2 to MDS slash AML. They have excluded pediatric patients from this because there was concern about overtreatment. These patients will be categorized, as I've said, and align with the AML groups. And I'm sure many of you will have seen the AML groups in the ICC and they are MDS slash AML with a TP53 with MDS related gene mutations or cytogenetic abnormalities or simply MDS slash AML NOS. What they feel then is that patients would be eligible for AML and MDS trials. So the WHO do reference this in their initial papers. Um, so they did review the BLAST threshold they highlighted the practical challenges that the BLAST-based cutoff is arbitrary, enumeration is subjective, which many of you will know that look at morphology, and there is no gold standard for BLAST enumeration. They looked at the pros and cons of adopting a 10% cutoff, but they felt that you were just replacing one cutoff with another, one arbitrary cutoff with another arbitrary cutoff, and there was a risk of overtreatment of these patients with AML therapy when it wasn't appropriate. They did, however, state that there is broad agreement that MDS with increased BLAST2 may be regarded as an ML equivalent for therapeutic considerations and trial design. So what does this mean? Is that patients historically diagnosed as MDS with excess BLAST2 may be regarded as ML equivalent for therapeutic considerations and trial entry. And really just on the other end of the spectrum with this boundary between AML and MDS, and this is actually a case that we had a few weeks ago. So this is, a, some of the cases may have been fictional, but this one is, is actually real. Um, so this was a 46-year-old female who presented to us with symptomatic anemia. Um, peripheral blood showed dysplastic neutrophils and the occasional blast. The bone marrow showed um, erythroid expansion, trilineous dysplasia, and 3% blasts, cytogenetics was normal, and then NGS showed mutations in MPM1 and WT1. So by the old WHO, this would be MDS with multilineage dysplasia. By the new WHO, this is ML, based on the presence of an MPM1 mutation. ICC, it is still MDS with multilineage dysplasia, unless it would unless there was more than 10% blasts in the context of an MPM1 mutation. And this is another discrepant area between the WHO and the ICC. So the WHO have remo removed the blast um, cutoff for AML with defining genetic abnormalities, but the ICC has retained this at 10%. So any of these defining genetic abnormalities with less than 10% blasts would be called AML by the WHO and MDS or the equivalent myeloid malignancy such as CMML, by the ICC. And this was really based on the fact that there's an expanding amount of data to say that patients that have an MPM1 mutation in MDS and CMML rapidly progress to AML. They usually have a worse outcome, and this is um, data about CMML patients um, comparing mutated and unmutated, and you can see the mutated patients in the blue line, which has a, have a very poor prognosis. And then if you lump myeloid, chronic myeloid malignancies together and compare that to AML, you can see, again, the blue line, which are the patients with MPM1 mutated um, chronic myeloid malignancies have a very poor prognosis. Um, there's also some data suggesting that these patients do better with intensive treatment. This is the data set used. You can see that they're by far these patients are MDS with excess BLAST2, and almost all of the intensively treated patients fall into that category. So we don't really have data on the low-risk patients or the historical low-risk patients. But there was some suggestion that chemotherapy patients, and this is the line in red, um, showed a better um, overall survival and event-free survival. Another complication, which uh, we have discussed 
a lot um, nationally, is that the ELN aligns completely with the ICC. So we all know that the ELN provides um, recommendations for diagnosis, prognostication and management of AML patients. And they 100% use the ICC classification, both for diagnosis and for um, risk stratification. Um, meaning that if you did diagnose by the WHO, you would then get conflicting um, information if you applied the ELN um, advice with regards to prognosis and management. And that applies with risk classification as well. And this actually came up in one, our patient very recently who had a biallelic CBP alpha, but wasn't, uh, uh, didn't have a BZIP in frame mutation in CBP alpha. So by definition, the WHO would have them as biallelic CBP alpha, but the ICC wouldn't because they only include BZIP mutated um, CBP alpha. So you would then be giving patients a good risk diagnosis, but they would not be good risk in the risk classification. So this is where it all gets very complicated and um, can be very confusing when you're trying to interpret this. So how do we manage the two classifications? So I'm, I'm, you're probably hoping that I'm going to tell you a finite or a, an actual uh, conclusion, but I think it's going to be more discussion about what we could do and what the plans are to try and make this easier. I think it's important that we have a consistent approach. This is really essential for trial entry to ensure that there's consistent consistency nationally and internationally if possible. Also access to therapy, particularly for drugs that we are accessing through the Cancer Drug Fund. And also for research, we want to be able to research patients um, that are defined consistently across different um, areas of the country. We want to limit complication and confusion for patients that are, or for clinicians that are trying to interpret this information, but also for patients that are trying to understand it. And we have to ensure that the solution is optimal for patient management. There are some practical, practical reporting issues that we have to remember. Coming from a lab, I always have to think about how this would work in our lab processes. And a lot of the processes we do require a single diagnosis to trigger what we do in the lab. And that will be difficult if we're potentially using two. Um, single terminology is also needed for both the electronic health record and cancer registration. Um, we know that SNOMED is used um, nationally across the NHS and that uses ICD-10. We also are mandated to give a, a classification of a diagnosis according to ICD-10 or ICD-O and ICD is owned and um, defined by the WHO. So those are very much linked to the WHO diagnosis. The other thing is trial entry requirements may actually enforce this issue and enforce us to use a particular classification system. So what advice have we had so far? So there was a statement published by the BSH and the British Lymphoma Pathology Group. Um, this was published in the BSH monthly president's newsletter. Um, it was circulated to the BLPG members and also in the RCPATH newsletter. So hopefully all of you will have seen this. The interim guidance is that we should continue using the 2016 revision of the WHO. Um, <clears throat> we should provide indicative diagnoses based on the two new classifications if it will impact on clinical care guidelines or trials. The plan was to organize educational events and workshops, and I know there has been a lymphoma educational event, um, and hopefully a, my a myeloid one will follow. Um, there was the aim to work with NHS England, and particularly the Genomic Medicine Service, to make sure that any plan aligns with the test directory and the plans, particularly within England, for um, how we implement that. Um, and also um, to work with clinical experts to feed into this. <clears throat> the, ultimately, the plan was to work with the RC Path to update the RC Path datasets, which will ultimately provide definitive guidance on diagnostic reporting. So the RC path data sets, for those of you that don't know, these are histopathological reporting um, data sets, which are um, available for all types of cancer through the Royal College. These help pathologists to work towards a consistent approach for reporting of common cancers. This is mainly from the laboratory reporting aspect. Um, and they define a range of acceptable practice in handling pathology specimens. So for hematology, 
this has been in the past mainly in lymphoma and solely in lymphoma actually. So we already have a data set which was last published in 2015 for lymphomas and this was for um, integration and reporting. And then there's also a pathway for how to manage tissue specimens, but this was lymph node spleen and bone marrow trephines. The plan would be to update the data sets, but to include both lympho lymphoid and myeloid malignancies. Um, and there is a data set writing group which has been formed. This is formed of experienced histopathologists, hematopathologists and hematologists from across the UK. The aim would be to provide definitive guidance, if we can agree, <laughs> um, on the diagnostic reporting of all hematological malignancies with particular ref reference to these two new classifications. The initial meeting has occurred and the subgroups have been defined and authors allocated and that work is in progress. So what are the potential solutions? So we could stick with the WHO 2017 until the authors from the two different classifications reach a compromise and then it'll probably be ready for the next classification by the time they do that. Um, but I think there is still a hope that we will get back to one classification, which of course would be the ideal scenario. And hopefully the authors will reach a compromise and we can do that soon or in time for the next update. The next update of the WHO will be in five years and I assume that the authors of the ICC would want to align with that and hopefully we can get a combined approach for that. We could choose one classification over the other or we could provide both the WHO and the ICC diagnoses. So I really think the first option is probably not um, going to be something we can do, mainly because we could end up hanging around waiting for way too long. And there is some very usable information in these classifications which can impact on patient management. What about choosing one classification? Well, which one would you choose? Um, I think this is where it gets very difficult. Obviously, we have the WHO, which um, we know that all cancers now are classified by a WHO classification, and that's what the Blue Book series is. Um, it has a very formal process. It has ICD um, classifications that we can use for reporting nationally. Um, it also had a broad range of experts that were involved in that classification. And then on the other hand, you've got the ICC, which used the historical WHO process, which has worked very well for previous classifications. Um, again, had a broad range of experts involved in writing this. Um, and aligns very closely with the ELN, which also has a big impact for um, the management, particularly of um, high-risk MDS and AML patients. I think the important thing to note is that both classifications have good points um, and bring out particular areas that maybe the other classification didn't. Um, I think it would be incredibly challenging to work with just one. Um, and I think that it would be very difficult to choose which one it should be. So what about putting both diagnoses on every report? Um, I know that there are some European groups um, that have mandated that that should be what happens, that we should be providing two diagnoses for every sample. Um, I think this is probably overkill. For a significant majority of cases, the diagnosis would be identical are only very minor differences in nomenclature. And if you look at some examples of this, MPN is a classic example where the diagnostic terms are identical and actually the diagnostic criteria are pretty much the same across the two diseases outside of CML, where there's a little bit of controversy there. Um, and then for something like MDS, these are just examples, this is um, sort of similar across other disease groups. Um, you've got very similar ways of classifying low-risk MDS, but just very subtle differences in names. So what you don't want is to be sort of beefing up your reports with putting MDS with Del5Q, but also MDS with low blast and isolated Del5Q, which essentially says exactly the same thing. Um, <clears throat> but really the key area is these diagnoses that differ. And we've highlighted four examples of those in the talk today. Um, and I think probably examples where that could impact significantly on patient management and will be a very difficult conversation to have with patients themselves. Um, 
So providing two different or conflicting diagnoses on a report, while that would be a, putting aside the sort of issues from a lab process perspective, that would potentially be a relatively easy thing to do. We, when we're reporting things out, we could just write two different diagnoses. But that is going to be a very confusing thing for clinicians to receive and for information to feedback. So interpretation, if we would do that, interpretation of that will be essential. So these interpretive comments will be needed. Um, also, we have to remember that the discrepant diagnoses that we have between classifications tend to be scenarios where there is contention or there's insufficient evidence to actually make a decision as to what we should do. <clears throat> so I think in this scenario, input from clinical experts is key. And when we're reporting discrepant diagnoses, it is essential to understand the practical implications for patient management. Um, I know that we, I, as um, Lance has highlighted, I sit on the MDS subgroup. Um, and this has come up a lot in our discussions nationally. Um, and I think <clears throat> the more I think about this, the more I think that what we don't want to do is just get bogged down with what things are named as, but we need to actually think about what that means when you are sitting with a patient and trying to feed that information back to the patient and what that means for the management of the patient. Um, and if we think about, the again, the boundary between MDS and AML, as, a, as an example, and probably the most contentious example across the two different classifications. So if we're thinking about <clears throat> this high-risk MDS group, or the 10 to 19% group, should these patients be treated as AML? Um, should they be all treated as AML? Should there only be a subgroup of them treated as AML? Should they be receiving standard AML therapy? Um, is there some way that we can define which patients should be receiving standard AML therapy? And then, I think where it does impact most is um, in newer drugs, which are currently only available for patients that have greater than 20% blasts. Um, will these be approved for patients that now fall into this new category of AML slash or MDS slash AML? Um, and I think that is a conversation which will be ongoing um, going forward and um, will hopefully feed into our discussions. So I think there is definitely a desire for consensus, both nationally and internationally. Um, <clears throat> I think what we really want to do, I think the, the ideal scenario would be that we would reach a consensus internationally and that everybody would be in agreement and we would all do the same thing. Um, and I know that the discussions are ongoing. There were discussions at ASH, there were presentations at ASH about this, and hopefully further discussions will occur at EHA. And over time, this will hopefully create some consensus opinion. Um, but I think what we really need is consensus opinion nationally as well. And I know that we have met within the NCRI AML and MDS groups to discuss these issues. Our plan, hopefully, is to write a consensus statement on how to practically implement the classifications, particularly with respect to patient management. What we really want to do is um, inform or provide guidance for um, national clinicians, particularly those that don't have expertise in this area, as to how we should be managing these situations, um, particularly the scenarios where we've mentioned, so this sort of high-risk MDS versus MDS slash AML, or those genetically defined groups, which is sort of defining a, an AML subgroup. Um, with potentially less than 5% blasts um, and how we should be managing those. These are obviously, that statement may be quite challenging to write, particularly this, these are sort of nuanced and the um, scenarios will be very different um, and um, complex in areas. Um, but this should hopefully help inform decision making in those cases at the boundary between MDS and AML. And I think as we write the data sets as well, we will identify other areas across different clinical groups where, feed, where feedback from the clinical experts will be key to help us to interpret these findings um, as we um, work through that. So in conclusion, 
The publication of two classifications for hematological malignancies really is a backward step, particularly for consistent disease classification, which we had um, for quite an extended period of time. This has created confusion and complications, both with regard to diagnostic terminology and laboratory processes. Both classifications introduce new categories which could impact on patient management and make discussions with patients challenging. The solution will require a standardised approach and multidisciplinary input. Um, and I think together with the data sets and with uh, clinical guidance and consensus statements, we should hopefully be able to deal, particularly with these scenarios where you've got conflicting diagnoses um, and how we should be reporting them. <coughs> you would imagine the scenario where we would put potentially put two conflicting um, diagnoses on a report, but be able to at least then say, what is the national recommendations about what you should do in that scenario? Hopefully then referencing um, consensus statements that are in the literature um, that have been um, inputted both from national experts and hopefully from international experts as well. Hopefully, a compromise will be reached in time for the next edition, and then all of this will be um, null and void. And that would be the ideal scenario. Um, so, thank you. I've left a few minutes, hopefully, for some, because I know this is an area where um, there's quite a lot of uh, controversy and people have strong opinions on it, so it will be quite interesting to hear what people think about this. Thank you. Thank you. We have a little gift for you to start. Oh. <laughs> um, and actually, whilst you say, um, we've only probably got a couple of minutes before the next session starts. So whilst I'm sure someone in the audience does have the equivalent of the Good Friday Agreement um, in a short sentence, I think it would probably be best if we um, don't delay those. And, um, but invite people to come and pursue you after the meeting if, um, if they're interested. Thank you. But please, so um, just, uh, accept our on gift. On behalf of the college, presenting Catherine with a small memento of uh, giving the Sir John Dacey lecture this year. Thank okay. you very much, Catherine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you.